Dear Christopher, Here is your friend Thomas the Tank Engine. He wanted to come out of the station yard and see the world. The story is telling you how he did it. I hope you will like them because you helped me to make them. Your loving daddy. The matter of what locomotive Thomas is actually based on has been a subject of debate in the Thomas community as of late. I am not here to get into all that, as I am personally fine with what Audrey eventually settled on. My take on the Thomas universe is designed to make things a little more realistic, while still maintaining as much existing railway series lore as possible. I've added a lot to what's already there, and minor changes to things like dates in the name of plausibility are common, but outright changing something like a character's basis is something I try to avoid, especially if I can work with what's already there. For example, I've pinned James's rebuild into a 260 as something done under the Northwestern Railway. And I filled out the locomotive roster to the over 80 claimed in Sodor reading between the lines. So what kind of locomotive is Thomas? Thomas is based on the E2 class of the London, Brighton, and South Coast Railway, with the obvious modifications to his running board. The E2s were intended as shunters and short-distance goods locomotives, and were trialed on suburban passenger services, but they had some notorious issues. Their water capacity was found to be lacking, which resulted in the latter half of the class receiving their distinctive extended tanks, and they had a tendency to rock from side to side when at speed, attributed to poorly balanced cylinders and wheels. It's also said that their coal capacity was insufficient, but they could carry the same amount as the successful E3 and E4 classes, so it's more likely their coal wasn't being used efficiently by the boiler. Ultimately, they were relegated to Southampton docks, where they were effectively phased out in the 1950s by engines more suited to the port environment. I know it's easy to take jabs at the E2s as being really useless engines, and indeed you may be wondering how in the realistic setting of the books, one of these locomotives could survive in service beyond desilization. It's stated in the iOS book that Sir Topham Hatt I apprenticed at Swindon alongside William Stanier, and built the vertical boiler tanks used by the Tidmouth, Knapford, and Ellsbridge Light Railway prior to the formation of the Northwestern. His friendship with Stanier was integral in the rebuilds of Henry and Gordon, and perhaps even other engines. It surprises me, then, that Audrey never so much as mentioned the idea that Hatt oversaw modifications to Thomas that would make him more mechanically sound. I'd like to direct you now to this video by Nick Train 123 that outlines a potential way to make the E2s just a little more useful. So here, friends, I present to you my headcanon for the origins of Thomas the Tank Engine. In 1915, the newly formed Northwestern Railway was in need of motive power. While they had worked out higher contracts with the neighboring Furness and Midland Railways, they knew that they would need locomotives of their own soon. One board member, having recently returned from holiday in the south of England, suggested purchasing a tank engine from the LBSCR. An E1-class tank was purchased for a nominal sum. However... In the confusion and hectic events surrounding the Great War, some things tended to slip through the cracks. It's not clear how, but a clerical error resulted in a brand new E2 class being sent instead. By the time the mistake was noticed, Thomas, as he would come to be known, had been put to work shunting trains at Vickerstown and would assist in the construction of the Northwestern Railway's network. Wanting to sweep the incident under the rug, the LBSCR allowed the NWR to keep the engine for the agreed price and built a replacement member of the class. During his time on the Northwestern, Thomas underwent a few modifications. The E2's issues were noted by locomotive superintendent Topham Hatt, and he drew up plans for a rebuild. In 1920, the boiler and blast pipe were replaced to reduce fuel consumption, and for unknown reasons, the running board under the cab was straightened. His air brakes were kept intact in order to work with the coaching stock from the Wellsworth and Suttery Railway, though his air pump would eventually be replaced with one with a greater capacity. 
In 1924, his cylinders were bored out to 18 inches. And of course, in 1960, the breakfast incident occurred, and he underwent a more drastic rebuild. I was eager to make Thomas from day one, but I wanted to wait until I felt I was experienced enough to tackle him. It was my intention for him to be the last of the Farker engines that I completed, but after I encountered <coughs> difficulties with Daisy and Mavis, I thought it best to fast-track Thomas and worry about those two later. It was... turbulent, but the end result turned out better than I could have imagined. I took my time with Thomas because I knew he was going to take a lot of work to get right, especially in HO scale. What I did know for certain was that I wanted two interchangeable bodies to represent pre-breakfast and post-breakfast condition. That is, with the curved and straight running plate respectively. I contacted Gavin, aka Sparkshot, and ordered downsized versions of his E2X bodies. These were originally made to fit a Bachmann 00 scale Jinty, but again, as I do HO and not 00, I would need to get creative and do a lot of math. The bodies were held up outside Heathrow for a while by the Royal Mail, which, while frustrating, did give me time to think about what to use as a chassis. The E2s had 4 foot 6 inch drivers and a 16 foot wheelbase. A pretty long engine compared to how Thomas is described, but I honestly can't imagine Thomas as anything else at this point. I eventually settled on the Bachmann LNER J72 as the best option short of scratch building a chassis, something I felt I wasn't ready for yet. The wheelbase and driver diameter, when converted to HO, were close enough to be viable. Plus, it's got a speaker and a firebox glow pre-installed, which will make Thomas the fanciest locomotive I own at the moment. I found one on Hattons with some cosmetic damage and ordered it. The thing is, though... So the thing about using existing ready-to-run chassis for custom locomotives is that you can't just... Uh, look at the wheelbase and the driver diameter and say, oh yeah, that's fine, that'll work perfectly. You've also got to account for the electronics that are inside and how those are going to fit inside the body. And it isn't exactly an easy thing to do uh, when all you've got to go off of is pictures online. Now these are my two Sparkshot E2 bodies over here, and this is, of course, the uh, Bachmann J72 chassis that I have a uh, source for Thomas. As I said previously, the uh, J72, it's got the right wheel, it's got the, it's got the right wheelbase and driver diameter, or at least close enough. Um, but obviously, um, yeah, that ain't gonna work. Which means, yeah, you've gotta basically cut into the body at the very least to get it to fit. Now I thought I could just cut into the body and be done with it. But you can probably see already that I have removed the motor from its leads. As you can plainly see, I have also shaved away a, a fairly sizable chunk of this, uh, this die-cast part that represents the bottom half of the boil- the bottom of the boiler on the J72 body. And so this is where the motor rests. And this is your printed circuit board. And right here, running down, that is your gearbox. As is, this will not fit the, J it, the E2 body. You could remove everything and reposition the motor and printed circuit board and try and make it fit that way. That, however, is not really something that I am <laughs> really interested in doing right now. So yeah, I had to end up cutting not only the body, but also the chassis as well. And I may have to shave off a little bit of this printed circuit board and the uh, part of the chassis that it is resting on, just to make sure that this will fit. Now here is the new shape Thomas body, which I have been prioritizing. I have been cutting away at this thing, constantly terrified that I was going to completely screw it up. But you can see that I've already shaved away quite a lot. There's... A couple parts where the the thickness of the walls is <laughs> I've, like especially on the smoke box saddle, I've nearly shaved in nearly shaved away the exterior of it, and I 
and this still is not enough to get it to fit properly. Part of that is the chassis block itself, and part of it is the printed circuit board at the back. So as you can see here, the chassis block is, it was right up to these little supports um, on the buffer beam of the E2 uh, that I assume were there to help it keep its shape during the printing process and to keep it from war keep the resin from warping. Other thing that's keeping it from fitting on is the printed circuit board at the back, which is equally frustrating. I've already cut away a little bit of the cab floor, um, basically where the ba boiler back head glues in. What I'm thinking I can do is still shave away a little bit, basically where the fo floor meets the front wall of the cab. Now, I'm trying very hard not to damage the interior. I do, I especially do not want the PCB just straight up going, just sticking into the cab. I want to have everything concealed inside the dang locomotive. I am really, really, really hoping that this still works out. And we shall especially see about whether or not I do this alongside uh, the old shape. Because, <laughs> um... Yeah, I, this is not a process that I would really like to repeat anytime soon. 3.28 a.m. Okay, update. So, um, I've shaved quite a bit away from the edges of the running board on the other side. And, um, I opened up the hole that the back head attaches to a little bit. Um, uh, it turns out I didn't need to cut into the... Uh, floor, cab floor basically at all but the point is that Thomas now fits on his chassis without issue Ooh, and actually if I where did I put the where did I put the freaking motor uh, there it is and actually if I put the motor and the decoder back in just pop that right there. If I have those in, yeah, he he goes on. Um, I still need to devise a method to keep him on. If I take out the motor, Thomas rolls almost without issue. There is a couple spots where um, there needs to be a, just a, just a hair more clearance for the uh, for the side rods, but other than that. He is ready to go. I'm gonna use some styrene and filler putty to uh, just fill in that gap in the cab floor that I didn't need, that I didn't actually need to cut out. Um, but once I have that done, he will be ready to go. One thing I failed to mention in that segment was that the J72's boiler sat lower than the E2's, and this was quite noticeable, especially after I cut into the E2's boiler so much. The gap left behind was incredibly nasty, and it made me wish that I had tried to reposition the motor. I decided to try and rectify the boiler situation by adding a bit of styrene to the diecast part on either side to fill in the gap. It wasn't perfect, and regardless, it still sits lower than where the E2's boiler would, but having the gap filled in does improve the look nonetheless. The splashers also help to mask this a little, but the valve gear is still practically invisible, which is a shame. I thought the hard part was over after that, but just as I went to take the side rods off of the wheels... After I calmed down, I went to Bachmann's UK parts store and ordered a replacement set of wheels. Since the J72 is available with red side rods, I went with that version as I was going to paint them red anyway. Once again, I thought the hard part was over. Tamiya light gray primer was applied before a coat of Mission Models MMP-112 Mecha Bright Blue. I would brush paint the black, red, and yellow trim on his windows and his cab and boiler backhead. 
During this whole process, I was also working on Annie and Clarabelle in Blender. I really liked the old trains models by Cam Scott that combined their depictions in the illustrations and the television series. The books depicted them in a similar shape to LMS Suburban Coaches, while their TV models were LBSCR Stroudly four-wheelers by 10 mil. I decided in turn to model my Annie and Clarabelle on Midland Railway Suburbans, using some of the same techniques I used while making Daisy, and like Daisy since they are too big for my Mars 3 resin printer, and I did not have a filament printer at the time, I ordered them through Shapeways. It was about this time that I took a two-week vacation from both my day job and the channel. When I came back and got readjusted to my proper time zone, I was revitalized and eager to get back to work. I opened the shipment from Shapeways and... <sighs> Alright, time for some context. Not long before I ordered Annie and Clarabelle, Shapeways upped the price on the material that I have favored for years, that being their smooth and smoothest fine detail plastic. This was in conjunction with the introduction of a new material, Gray Fine Detail Plastic. Now these things were going to be pricey either way, but I wanted to save some cash and figured that I would try this new material to see how it fared. This was the single biggest mistake I've made so far in this project. I don't know if the Texas heat might have done something to the prints during shipping, but every single one was warped and bowing, and the roofs were just straight up failed prints with blotches on their surface and each one randomly missing oil lamps. I don't mean they broke off in transit, I mean they were straight up missing. This crap is bendy and rubbery, and while it might be useful for gaming miniatures, it is completely useless for model railroading. So I had a dilemma. I could chill out another 500 bucks to have them reprinted in the superior material, or wait and try to print them myself on a brand new entry-level FDM printer. I wisely chose the former. Anyway, going back to Thomas, I added wire handrails to his smoke box and painted his running board, safety valve, splashers, and cab by hand. His Westinghouse air pump is a piece I designed myself to be a standard fitting for my NWR locomotives. I also noticed that the side tanks appeared to be a different shade from the rest of the body, possibly due to improperly mixed paint, and as such I had to mask off everything else, sand down the affected areas, and then reapply the blue. Only then could I apply a gloss lacquer and apply water slide lining and his number one for my custom NWR decap. <sighs> I don't know how this happened. So this stuff is called Liquid Shine. I've used it plenty of times before on this series, but for some reason it just didn't seem to want to do its job this time. I had previously experienced this on a van kit I was building where the paint was coming off during decal application and I think it might have something to do with what I was putting on top. Microset and Microsol are a popular set of chemicals by Microscale that are used to apply decals and make them stick properly without silvering. Previously, I had used a Mr. Hobby product, but I found out that stuff really doesn't like Fox Transfer's lining, as I explained with Rosie, and I had to seek out something else. I guess there's something in the liquid shine and microset that don't really like each other, and the reaction eats away at the liquid shine, thus allowing water to mix with the acrylic paint underneath and ruining the whole thing. If I was gonna keep using microset then, I was gonna need a different gloss coat, and thus I turned to Tamiya's Gloss Clear Spray. My local stores didn't have it at stock at the time, and I had to order it online, and I cannot emphasize how agonizing the wait was. When it finally did come, I touched up Thomas's paint, applied it, and the, the decals went on without issue. Finally, Annie and Clarabelle's new prints arrived. And let me tell ya, I am livid that Shapeways is discontinuing this stuff. At this point I had my new Ender 5 S1 set up and functioning, so I opted to print their floors myself. Eventually I'll get around to adding interiors, but that's gonna be a ways off. With me having to start over on Daisy, I'll probably practice modeling an interior for her and see how that goes. I failed to mention in the Toby video what paint color I chose for Henrietta. The shade is Carrot Top Red by Reaper, with all the black parts of course being Vallejo Nato Black because I love that stuff. With all the paint and lining applied, it was time for weathering, a final coat of matte clear, a crew in his cab, and real coal in the bunker. Normally, this would be where the story ended, but there was one last thing I needed to take care of. All my standard gauge engines are equipped with DCC decoders, usually basic ones without sound or any other fancy features, 
but since Thomas had a speaker pre-installed, I wanted to take advantage of that. I decided it would be worth buying an ESU Lux Sound Decoder and a Lux Programmer Kit, as that's the only brand I know of that allows you to program custom sounds. And since I definitely want to do this for more locomotives in future, I decided it was a worthwhile investment. I thought it would be as simple as, put the sound you want into this slot and set the chuff rate, but found it to be a lot more complicated than that. It's a lot more like coding, and it's not friendly to the computer illiterate, and the existing tutorials online are not very helpful to a beginner. Eventually, I managed to figure it out by essentially reverse engineering an existing sound slot. So then, let's have a listen, shall we? There isn't too much just yet. There are many more sound slots that I intend to fill once I have a better handle on Lock Programmer. But for now, these will suffice for any running session. Thomas has been a long time coming for me. I didn't think he would take as long as he did once I started him. It's almost as if he just didn't want to be made. But I suppose it's like Thomas to be difficult, both in the books and to his creator. And in the end, the effort was all worth it. I will say though, I wish I had waited to start him until I had the experience necessary to make a custom chassis for him. The J72 runs well enough, and the firebox glow is nice, but the boiler situation as I described earlier is always going to be egging at me at the back of my mind. Perhaps when I make his earlier form I'll be able to make something proprietary. Regardless though, Thomas is now one of my favorites in the collection, simply for just how much work I put into him and how fantastic the end result is. Plus, it's Thomas. The cheeky, little blue tank engine with a heart of gold, who taught us that little engines can do big things.
Thanks for watching this episode of Custom Showcase. If you want to see more, be sure to subscribe and enable notifications. I've got a lot more planned down the line, so stay tuned. Thomas and I can't wait to see you again.